so this is the first of the uh, the Route 6 Hangouts, and we're entitling these um, Ask Us Anything. And we're really just encouraging our industry colleagues, engineers, operators, people like that uh, in the TV facilities industries to, um, uh, to join us or even just to watch this after the event. Uh, we plan to make each one about an hour long uh, and talk about things that are relevant uh, to the state of our industry as it is. Um, they will be, by necessity, be quite technical. Um, uh, today we intend to talk about uh, audio loudness, uh, R128 and, and, and ITU 1770, which is, of course is the current standard that everybody's talking about. And come October, we'll be enforced um, uh, through the DPP uh, specification here in the UK and, and in fact in America, uh, ITU 1770 is already mandated in law. So we'll talk a bit about uh, audio loudness. We're going to talk a little bit about um, what uh, a couple of our colleagues saw at NAB and, and how that went for them. And uh, uh, obviously 4K and ultra high definition television is the kind of thing that everybody's talking about at the moment. Um, we intended to talk a little bit about Heartbleed, um, the, uh, the, the open SSL vulnerability, um, which is bedeviling web servers at the moment, which um, rather splendidly, we've got um, our, our good industry friend, uh, James Seward, who used to work for Amulet, uh, who's with us. And, and uh, as, as I've said before, we, uh, we walk in the, uh, the, the, the mountains, in the foothills of the mountains of his knowledge when it comes to web servers. So um, I'm going to just go once around the table. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in the Route 6 workshop in, in, uh, in um, Finsbury Park. Uh, Neil Kemsley uh, is over there in uh, Route 6 Soho. Am I right? Or are you over in West? Where are you, Neil? I'm, I'm in the, uh, the, the central office, as it were. Uh, and I'm in the, the, uh, in the demo room, in fact. So sorry for the slightly echoey sound. Uh, hopefully I'll get that sorted by the uh, next day. And all the way from Canada, our splendid colleague Matt Ward, the king of the audio. Matt, how's it going? How is it in Canada? It's uh, very snowy. <laughs> and over in Route 6 West, am I right, Marcus? Are you over with the, where the dev team work at the moment? Yeah, that's right. I'm in the Route 6 development office over in Berwick Street. Fantastic. Just me and Damien today. Damien's coding away. So. Oh, keep, keep him off the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and face the radio, eh? <laughs> <laughs> And Graham McGuinness, you're you're in the, what looks like the boardroom at Route Six, uh, I mean, main I mean office, the top floor room. Yes, I think our experience previously we found with hangouts that the quite unexpected effect that you can't have sort of two people in a hangout sort of physically proximate to each other. It's kind of one of those things you wouldn't think would be a problem, but it, it is. So hopefully the, it, the sound here is very live and echoey also. So I apologize in advance for that. We'll try and do something about that next time, definitely. Well, it was very timely because um, one of the things we said we were going to talk about today is um, is audio loudness. And uh, ordinarily I sit next to, to, to Matt, our desks are next to each other. And whenever I say loudness, I say perceived loudness. And he always corrects me and says, no, 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 loudness is a perceived phenomena loudness is is nothing else if not perceived um so matt can you can you give us um a, a bit a bit of an intro you wrote a couple of fantastic blog posts which are up on on, on route6.com um uh, about audio loudness and why we're having to deal with it now um i mean so uh so first of all just once again to reiterate that it's um what what, what we're seeking to deal with is perceived loudness and and traditionally, we measure an audio signal um, doesn't account for the human me hearing mechanism, um, and um, and so we have to understand that if we're going to make things better for listeners, make things better for the TV viewers, stop them having to reach for the uh, remote control every two seconds, we need to to categorise an audio, audio signal by how we hear it. So um, it was actually some Canadian researchers originally. And developed a mechanism for doing this, which is uh, categorized under ITU BS1770, um, originally known as the K weighting, which uh, measures an average uh, of the audio signal and also frequency weights the audio signal and, and also weights the location of the channels. So the rear channels. Um, are accounted for the fact that the rear channels, loud sounds coming from the rear are more disturbing to a human being than loud sounds from the front. And, um, and, and they did a lot of work on these standards. And, and what I think a lot of people miss with these standards is that they did a lot of work um, making sure that the, the measurements that they get out of this correlates to, to observable phenomenon. It correlates to 
people's real experience. Um, and the other thing that a lot of people miss is, is that, um, that then the EBU and, and in the States, the ATSC decided to use this standard to try and get some recommended practices together for how we should mix TV and how we should measure TV signals such that we get a coherent flow from one program to the next um, and in the fullness of time hopefully between different channels and, and that's what our EBU R128 is in, in Europe or ATSC A85 is in the US and so I mean that's the basic I mean generally traditionally although we have guidelines for mixing largely our audio deliverable standard is primarily determined by peak levels and if we and of course everyone wants to make sure their program is peaking so that it's as perceptually loud as it can be so it's noticeable and if everybody is hitting the same peaks then the average signals which really determines how it's perceived um, uh, varies depending on how aggressively a program is mixed what the content is you know that's why nature documentaries uh, very quiet passages just with a, a, a voiceover will sound much, much quieter than, you know, a hard-hitting um, uh, uh, bumper or um, advert in the next um, next period. So that that's why we really needed to do this work and sort of uh, where it all comes from. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, um, you, we're not quite there yet, but in the fullness of time, the hope is that there'll be legislation acro across broadcasters, so the perceived loudness of every channel and every um, every program is is effectively within a couple of dBs. So the, the the perennial problem is 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 people not liking having to adjust the volume on their telly sets when they get to the ad break. Now, I mean that that's probably the thing that's driving it the most, isn't it? Absolutely. That, and also, but people don't like changing the volume. As much as advertisers like to, you know, make things perceptually loud to attract your attention, so do channels. You know, when you're flitting between channels, channels, there's a competition at the moment. Yes. Who, who can have the loudest channel? And uh, and and it really, the the viewer doesn't like it. The viewer um, really disengages from it. So um, so the idea is to get some kind of order to to how we broadcast. Well, so, and so unless, be, unless you're a fan of Nigerian yeah, soap operas. Have you ever been up into the 500s on Sky? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Graham. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Phil. I mean, just in terms of speaking to people about this, is it a, would it be a truism to say that generally it, it, the standard tries to average audio out across the program, or is that far too simplistic a, a description of, of what and they're trying to do? That's with. exactly what it's doing. It's, it's looking at a, a more long-term measurement but even um, I, and there are some guidelines for peak levels but, but what comes out of this if everybody's not battling to make their program sound as loud as possible we don't need to worry much about the peak levels we can allow and, and you know we can allow a lot more peak headroom right. okay. because because traditionally we were normalizing peaks so people wanted to get the relationship between the average sound level and the peak sound level as close as possible which is why I mean you know to, to be horrifically blunt so much sounds rubbish these days yes yes okay <clears throat> um, so I mean uh, it looks like it's October that, that you know there's going to be seriously you know people are having to deliver to ITV and, and BBC uh, meeting uh, loudness guidelines um, uh, and so you know it's something that people if they haven't been thinking about it need to think about it now like any big changes there's a little bit of a reaction a lot of people you know we have to jump through these extra hoops we have to get our guys to mix again and what people mix is a, a misses a lot of the research into this and the idea of where the loudness level should be set is dictated by how programs traditionally were. So if you mix a nicely balanced program, obviously depending on the genre, if, but if you mix a nicely balanced uh, drama at the sort of levels you traditionally would, but don't worry about putting your peak limiter 
at minus nine DVFS anymore, uh, you'll 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 be in the right ballpark for the standard. So people do need to consider their workflows, but it's it's not a devastating change in terms of the mixers should just try and mix, make something sound natural, make it sound good. Don't try and compete on level anymore. Don't try and make it sound loud anymore. Just mix a nicely balanced program. And, you know, obviously, you know, pay a bit of attention to where your dialogue is hitting and your dialogue is consistent or your VO, depending on the program. And, um, and, and it should fall out in the wash. And then small changes can be made later to make the program fit what's required. So obviously... The, the part part of, of loudness measurements, we've, we've got the, these new units now, LUFS, uh, you know, loudness units, or LKFS, the Americans are calling it. Um, uh, and and my first thought, I mean, a couple of years ago now, when, when, when this all sort of started to rear up, was what on earth does that look like on a traditional meter, and, and how do I measure that, and how does that relate to, um, you know, the kind of audio lineup signals that as an engineer I'm used to looking at rather than real proper audio which kind of audio people are used to looking at um, and uh, last week uh, Matt and I uh, shot some video of um, uh, a Tektronix WFM uh, series scope with the loudness option fitted and uh, we also stuck some PPMs in vision so you could see exactly what the PPMs were doing and there were some very interesting sort of results I mean it, uh, we ran through um, just, just sort of standard test signals so neg 18 dbfs tone neg 12 dbfs tone and, and, then, and then we ran some program material through it which had all been I'd all sort of snagged off air via um, the DVB-T mux and uh, very interesting that 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 the the, the, the commercial that, that we've put in this video that to to, sh to show what something looks like when it's in violation. Um, uh, you know, if you're just looking at it on on PPMs, you'd never know that PPMs just aren't man enough anymore to to really tell you, you know, what 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 the what the rolling loudness average looks like. Um, and so I don't know is it, is it a good moment for us to sort of sling that video up? I mean, we can just skip through it and I'll splice it in. Um, to the finished, you know, topped and tail piece at sound, the end. Sound, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this would be amazing if this works. But I've got it. I've <laughs> got it up on a YouTube uh, playlist. Now I don't know whether um, if I play this, whether you all get to see it. So let's give that a go. This is a little clip just to show uh, what uh, loudness monitoring looks like uh, when done baseband. Is that playing uh, HDS no, we're we're not, we, can't, um, wave. we can't see it, Philly. Really. Okay, so if you go to your YouTube um, uh, glyph, you know, the little YouTube icon oh, yeah. on the left, yeah? Do you get to see a playlist? Is yeah, it? the Root Sticks podcast loudness by Phil. Ah. Cool. Okay, so you, oh, I don't know what perhaps everybody has to play it together. Um, ah. But which, which is probably a bit daft so what's what i'll do is i'll play it and talk about it so it obviously winds up on the recording and and then we can splice it in okay oh i don't i don't know what's what what what, what, do, what do you think matt well it's playing now for me oh is it really you, you played it yeah 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 and is it is it because uh, i've skipped through a few frames then i've skipped back to the start are you seeing the yeah, same well i'm following your, your jumps it's okay it. okay so if you all have a quick look at your um your youtube app and hopefully you'll see this as I, as I play it for everybody. Uh, what uh, loudness monitoring looks like uh, when done baseband, i.e. HDSDI into a, a Tektronix um, waveform monitor. Um, this is the display we'll be looking at uh, as we play this out. Uh, this is our typical kind of tech uh, WVR stroke WFM series waveform monitor um, with the loudness option installed. It's a, it's a free software update if you haven't yet got it on yours. And you'll be looking at the, the true peak uh, value here, uh, the short loudness and the infinite loudness, which is the really important one uh, that, 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 that is measured across the whole duration of a program. Um, I'll put up uh, links to the, uh, the EBU papers that describe exactly this, but for the minute this is really just a, to, to, so you can see what exactly uh, we're looking at. Uh, my initial um, uh, uh, two clips I'm going to play through the tech are, are just neg 18 dbfs tone and then neg 12 dbfs tone, so you can kind of calibrate uh, your thinking as to how um, loudness measurement works and you can see you know, what you're typically looking for on the short and the infinite loudness and the loudness range and, and the true peak values and then I'm going to play um, some parts that were clipped from a, an off-air recording um, uh, from ITV um, uh, very recently so this is this is a recording of, of Murder She Wrote um, on the uh, the 30th of March this year just a few just a few weeks ago um, 
Uh, this is the waveform down below of the relevant uh, uh, part. It's a bit more than an hour. And we're going to be looking sort of between uh, this portion here. So if I, if I zoom in on that, that'll become a bit clearer. Uh, and essentially, um, you know, if you, if you sort of run your eye along this, you can tell there's kind of something going on here. This, this part here is program segment. And we'll be looking at about three minutes worth of program segment and doing a bit of an analysis of that. And, and, then, and then we've got some net, a couple of network promos. Then we've got some commercials. Then we're back into the program. Now, the thing to, to notice on this waveform is that that level-wise, we're consistent. You know, we're, 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 you know the, the whole the, the whole piece um, isn't isn't really going um, uh, you know outrageously loud. So I kind of, of I kind of, of gas on a lot about this, but let's let's just jump into um, uh, some of the some of the meat of it. So hang on a second. Okay, so so this is. Can you, can you see what we've got here? We've got. Um, oh, come on. So you can see we've got PPMs in Vision um, showing us what we'd expect for Neg18 tone. You know, zero dBUs, um, and 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 so that was. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to pause that um, now the clip's played through and you'll, you'll see that the infinite loudness value has, has stuck um, and, 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 and the, 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 you know, we, we can see the true peak which is the real genuine loudest digital bit of the, of the file or of the, the digital stream that was being paid, played through the tech has kind of has stuck at neg 18 dBFS it was a neg 18 tone and our, 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 our infinite measurement there is at neg 18 obviously the short loud is measured over a rolling three seconds. So once the clip's finished playing for more than three seconds, that's no longer relevant. And then we've got a loudness range, which actually should be very small. I suspect that's probably just the transient from when the clip started playing that we've actually managed to catch a couple of dBs of, of the loudness range. But that's what neg 18 tone looks like, you know, when, when, you, when you measure it on the, on, on the loudness meter. So I'll spin that forward a tiny bit more. And this is this is again just test tone, but six dBs hotter. So so that's why on the on the PPMs you're seeing it at five and a half, six dBs hotter than the zero level we had before. And uh, you know we've got a short and an infinite because um, I've paused the clip, a short and an infinite um, figure which are almost the same at neg twelve dBFS. And uh, let's play that and see how it goes. And, and, and again, that's kind of you know, this is just really I suppose about calibrating your um, the way you think about um, uh, uh, sort of loudness and, and what you expect to, to see on an old school PPM and also on the new uh, style of display. I'm going to spin that forward a bit further. Now this is a bit of program segment, so this is this is you know again grabbed straight off the DVB Mux uh, ITV off air, and, uh, and 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 again just to see I suppose how much how much richer. Everything now is because it's not just test time. Intelligent want to simply buy up your many, many debts and demand payment. I can assure you my decision will be based solely upon which option will cause you the most pain. Now, as to the amount of money I intend to sue you for, I kind of like the roundness of the 40 million you mentioned in your cartoon. In dollars, of course. I'm just telling the both of you that whatever I suffer because of you two, I will... So you can see that, um, uh, you know, as we'd expect with properly mixed stuff, the PPMs, we're never seeing the peak LEDs come on the PPMs. That's exactly what, you know, an old school dubbing mixer from five years ago would, would, would be doing if he was mixing this in stereo. Um, and our, our short loud and our infinite loud, our short loud obviously changes every three seconds because that's the integration time for the short loud uh, signal. And, and, and then the infinite integration time, which isn't really infinite because it hasn't been running since the start of the universe, uh, but it, it running since the start of the program. You reset it when you want to start making your loudness measurement. Um, uh, obviously, the short loud feeds into the infinite loud, and at the moment uh, we're at neg twenty one point seven. Remember, the spec is neg twenty three uh, LUFS, uh, but but it's measured across the whole um, piece, and so you, you know as as this goes on, and I think there's about three minutes of it, it settles very very nicely. Uh, uh, on neg 23 and and you know it looks like a very sort of nicely mixed good piece of of, of television um you see the true peak is at neg 2 uh, sorry neg 6.2 uh db true peak um which if you think about sort of neg 10 dbfs being 8 dbs hotter 
the neg 18 which is our lineup level you start thinking oh true peak really is quite hotter than than what we think of as a peak i.e where where peak leds start lighting up on ppms but i suppose this is just kind of reflective of the fact that we're now in a, a much sort of like wider dynamic range digital age um but having said that the loudness range doesn't look that great i suppose that's kind of typical for for finished program audio but uh, we're just getting towards the end of this piece now, so, so just give this like another 20 seconds to finish. Then after less than, less than three minutes of Murder, She Wrote, where you know, our infinite rolling average is exactly where it should be, within one LU of neg 23 LUFS, and so it's gone green on the tech, so the tech's happy, and no doubt if we were analyzing this in you know, vid checker or some other file based checker, um, you know, we'd, we'd be seeing the same measurement. So the next thing we look at is, uh, I'm just going to spin this through quickly, um, is a, a network promo. Um, uh, again, you'd expect this to be a bit punchier. You'd expect ITV to have mixed this a bit a bit harder so that it was, uh, you know, louder, if you will. But as you can see from the uh, the infinite reading there, it's exactly where it wants to be. It's just fine. Now, this is the really interesting one for me. This is a, a commercial. Now, we're not seeing any peaks at all on the PPMs. Um, you know, there's no worries there. Uh, but even now, our infinite uh, loudness, uh, you know, is still quite, um, it's, it's higher than it really should be. And we've only got 30 seconds, really, for, for, a, for an average figure to be correct over the piece. So, uh, you know, not long left now for this commercial. Phil, can I just speak, what's really interesting there um, is, is you notice the tr Sorry, Matt, I think I, I inadvertently muted you there, Matt. Do you want to unmute yourself? Um, can you hear me? Yep, that's good. Yeah. Okay, so, so notice that the true peak on that commercial, which was obviously a lot perceptually louder than, than the Murder, She Wrote piece, the true peak is actually a dB and a half quieter. Yes. And that's because of these modern mixing techniques where people use very harsh limiters to constrain, to push up the average loudness of commercials. And, and this is the entire problem that over the course of time, R128 and ATSC A85 are aiming to uh, to try to eliminate. But I found it pretty interesting that, that um, you know, ITV are still transmitting um, commercials that uh, will fail. Um, come October, I kind of thought they, they they would have got their their act together a bit sooner. And I was talking to Simon Brett at Fox Channels, and th their their strategy at the moment is they're telling all their suppliers uh, Neg 24 LUFS uh, with eight LUs of tolerance, uh, and and they're reducing it by one LU every month. And this is to try and train their particularly Italian suppliers. To, to produce audio that, that that's actually becoming compliant, you know, getting close. Because at the moment, apparently, the Italians have have kind of no interest whatsoever in 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 mixing things, you know, in a sort of restrained fashion. Has anybody else had uh, had any experience of of the old loudness um, uh, debate, as it were? Well, I guess the classical music uh, one's always a. Uh, an interesting one, isn't it? So, so you know, you're, you're listening along in the car in a quiet country lane, going 30 miles an hour, listening to some delicate piece of classical music, and then all of a sudden you're uh, turning onto a busier road where the road noise is louder and stuff like that. So you're creeping the volume up, and all of a sudden everybody in the car is starting to complain because you, know, you want to hear the dynamics of the music, but uh, they don't want to hear the stuff to be deafened because you're having to compete with the road noise. So this is sort of uh, well, that's the case in my family, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's actually, yeah, I mean, to take it off with a minor tangent, um, it's actually very interesting you mentioned classical music, because if you take R128, where you're looking for an average infinite loudness of minus 23 loves, um, and you're saying that the true peak, and I think maybe we'll have a bit of a discussion about what true peak is uh, in a minute, um, but your true peak is is constrained now. Rather than minus nine dBFS, which is traditional with broadcast, your true peak now can be minus one dBFS. True peak, and um, and the reality is is that um, having had a chat with Bob Ludwig, who's a famous American mastering engineer in the music world, is he's only found 
two pieces of classical music which, when recorded, are more dynamic than that dynamic range. So, so it, we're giving people back the ability to use dynamics. Now, that's not yeah. necessarily um, great for TV because we do need some dynamic range compression if you're going to play things in the average domestic living room. You sure. don't want a massive dynamic range, but, but, but the reality is the standard will handle everything but the most dynamic uh, classical music out there. So it means that, that you know your last night of the proms can now be delivered as people in the hall can hear it. Yeah. Splendid. Okay, well, as mentioned, uh, there are a couple of fantastic um, entries on the Route 6 blog, and th there's that video in its entirety as well, which I'll kind of hack up a bit and, and, and drop into the recording of this. Uh, but uh, that's, you know, I mean, we, we could chew the fat on uh, on audio loudness forever, but um, uh, that that's audio loudness. Um, I wanted to turn to NAB, and, and, and particularly you, um, uh, Neil and Marcus, what, 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 what you might have seen and, 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 and what was really good. And Marcus, you obviously um, uh, run the content agency, side of things. Um, do you want to give us a quick rundown as to what new features or what, what things you were showing on Content Agent this time and, and, and you know what sort of reception you got for it? Yeah, sure. I guess the, the three things uh, that are hot in Content Agent land at the moment are uh, obviously um, DPP file, uh, file creation, um, including integration with uh, VidChecker. Um, so obviously, what we're able to do is um, make a file to the DPP specification, inject the metadata to the um, to the DPP spec, uh, MXF wrap it, uh, and include a, a, a vid checker report um, alongside the file as as mandated by the DPP. Um, you know, it's legislation, or uh, legislation is the wrong word, but, you know, broadcasters in the UK will only be accepting files in DPP uh, format from the 1st of October this year, and that's a real hot topic for production companies and, and post-production companies right now. And we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of interest in what we're doing. We're, we're running a Stepping Stones event on the 30th of April, uh, which... Uh, has been publicised through the Route 6 newsletter, which we're, uh, funnily enough, uh, have got uh, Simon Brett from Nat Geo, as, as you mentioned earlier, is coming along, because he's a man who bears the scars of, uh, of having accomplished a file-based DPP delivery. Um, the second thing is um, uh, phase-correlated uh, frame rate conversion, um, motion-compensated frame rate conversion. Um, this is um, file-based um, standards conversion, essentially, uh, which is um, something which we showed first at NAB last year. Um, we've come a long way since we first showed it in conjunction with uh, Cinefilm, who are the guys who, who are, um, whose, whose technology we're licensing. Um, BBC Sport are taking five content agent systems with Tacky on out to uh, the Football World Cup this year. So uh, their endorsement is, is is one which we value very highly. Um, and um, the third thing that we showed, which is of, of, of great interest at the moment, is, is ingest from camera cards, which allows us to do um, take a camera card structure do an OP atom wrap and uh, um, check into Avid Interplay, for example, if that's the editing environment you're working in. Um, and, uh, you know, each of those things are, are, are things which are, um, you know, solving problems for, for customers uh, that we're in contact with throughout the world at the moment. Splendid. But you were, you were, you were tied to the Route 6 technology stand? I was pretty much tied to the Route 6 technology stand. There were a couple of interesting announcements at the show, though, within the sort of general world of transcoding. One was that Digital Rapids was acquired by um, Harris, who have rebranded their broadcast division, Imagine Communications, uh, and that was announced uh, the day before the show started, I think. 
Uh, and the other one was that uh, that Amberfin has been acquired by Dalet. Um, so there's a bit of a changing landscape in in the transcoding world at the moment. But what a bit of a shake-up or a bit of a bit of a rationalisation, a necessary one, or? Um, I'm not sure. I think you know, Digital Rapids are people that we've worked with and been working with um, for uh, baseband video capture for a number of years. Um, and their market is really rather more a live streaming market, I think, whereas, whereas ours is, 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 is less of that. We focus more in broadcast and, uh, and post-production worlds. Um, I, I really don't know. I, I, I don't know why Harris, what Harris would see in, in Digital Rapids that's attractive, or, or vice versa, to be perfectly honest. Um, Amber Finn and Dalet, again, you know, Dalet make a, 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 um, a, a famous for um, asset management uh, at this moment in time. And obviously, transcoding, file transcoding is really at the heart of, of, of asset management. So that tie up makes a little bit more sense to me. Um, albeit that Amber Finn, you know, are people who are perhaps um, better known for working in a baseband video world than a file-based world, obviously. So watch this space, I guess, Phil. Okay. Neil, what did, what, what did you see that was good at, uh, in, in Las Vegas, apart from the ghost of Elvis? <laughs> the ghost of Elvis, yeah. Um, so uh, what was very interesting was Avid's new venture uh, with their Avid Customer Association. Uh, and they put on a, uh, a couple of days of very interesting presentations uh, with lots of people uh, being able to participate in Avid's future. And that's that's the kind of notion behind ACA is, is uh, having uh, the customer and third party suppliers contribute to uh, the future development of the products. And, uh, they have really uh, gone into this new venture uh, with a very open approach, which is very exciting to the APIs that Avid used to release their products, uh, which historically have been fairly limited uh, in the way that uh, they have exposed their uh, programming interfaces to third parties. Well, they also really kind of uh, they really held them like to their chest. The storage they? vendors, so. for example. What? That's right, yeah, yeah, it's like a good Vegas poker players, you know. Uh, but but now we're going to see, I think, uh, certainly storage vendors uh, being able to participate as the base storage for Avid's Interplay product, for example, uh, where they haven't been able to in the past. And uh, lots of other related developments there that will come in the true, trueness of time sort of thing. So as, as Avid uh, make these APIs available. So I think there's going to be some very interesting uh, news uh, coming up on that uh, in, as time goes by. Um, Avid also introduced a new licensing model for their Media Composer product line. So not only have you got these sort of perpetual licenses bound to dongles or software activations, uh, but they're now also going to open up the possibility to either um, activate the product uh, through sort of like a cloud uh, annual subscription style of license. Uh, or a monthly license indeed. So, so if you needed a short-term project and you needed extra editors to work in that, you could effectively uh, subscribe to Media Composer for uh, just a month if you needed to. Oh, so like Adobe, uh, you're, also, you're you're hiring it for a, you know, for you pay, you use it, you pay, you use it kind of thing. Yes, the the basically the the subscription model yes. that they're offering is it's similar to that. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Neil, I, forgive me for jumping in. So I, th I think that's going to be a very interesting uh, possibility there. And then they're also opening up the fourth possibility, which is to have a license server available in your facility uh, to enable floating licenses. So you could, for example, have um, 30 licenses and maybe 50 potential workstations, uh, but only 30 of those would be able to check out that license at any given time. So this makes uh, facility management much more straightforward. They previously uh, for educational facilities, and they've now opened that up for uh, other production facilities, not non 
and educational facilities. So there are effectively four different license making, and I think that makes uh, um, license management uh, somewhat more straightforward for Android users. You're not just locked into using a dongle if you don't want to. You can now use the sort of traditional software activation, or you can choose to uh, purchase the uh, license over a shorter period of time. Uh, or you can uh, bind all your licenses to internal server and not have to deal with uh, internet activation, for example, if you're in a very secure environment. That's another advantage to uh, the server. So moving away from Avid, uh, we saw some very interesting developments for uh, Adobe Anywhere, where we're seeing more and more manufacturers providing uh, products, asset management component of the uh, Anywhere product which is something that Adobe haven't really uh, uh, built into the product in any way. And I saw a very interesting product from a company called Empress, um, who make a, a very mature database that ties into uh, the Anywhere product. So Anywhere is um, Adobe's um, editing uh, across uh, a thin network uh, solution, so remote editing, effectively. Um, and of course, you know, it ties into this sort of new business cloud model, um, which is going to be very interesting for folks who don't want to be in the edit facility. Um, so, for example, on location uh, or just uh, contributing from a another place. Um, so this whole sort of uh, collaborative editing uh, possibilities are opening up um, to various different manufacturers. Avid also have their Everywhere products, so they're Avid Everywhere. So getting those two nomenclatures confused is going to be very easy for us, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, um, I think that uh, it certainly opens up for very interesting possibilities uh, across multiple platforms. 4K was another buzzword at the show. Um, I think that uh, a lot of people clearly gearing themselves up to the possibility of future um, delivery uh, in 4K format, and we're seeing lots of storage products and asset management products and acquisition products gearing up for 4K. Obviously, the uh, bandwidth required to uh, play out uh, 4K material are much more stringent. The data rates are much higher. So technologies such as fiber channel and SAS and Thunderbolt are becoming more and more important to the storage back end of uh, 4K. And uh, we were certainly seeing lots of examples of uh, affordable Thunderbolt products, for example, but also uh, very interesting uh, fiber channel based uh, products, from example, for example, from people like DVS uh, with their new Spicer Cell product, making uh, 4K capable uh, storage uh, a possibility. So um, I think, you know, if, 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 if you saw nothing else at the show, you would have seen 4K plastered virtually everywhere there, had you been there. I, th I think the interesting um, thing for me, having not been at NAB, but just kind of getting all the noise from outside the show, is just how, yeah. how dead 3D sort of really is kind of outside yeah. the cinema. Um, you know, the, the last sort of two to three years, it was all about sort of, you know, stereoscopic and stereo workflows and all this kind of stuff. And 3D, the, the sort of the 3D buzzword has now been replaced by the, the 4K buzzword and the, 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 the HFR. So, yeah. Neil? It's still there and people are still presumably trying to uh, work with it. Uh, 3D, that is. Yes, I would say that. So, yeah. Just but still showing the technology. But uh, 4K is more of the thing. So we were seeing, for example, Aja release their Scion camera, C-I-O-N. I'm assuming that's how it's pronounced. I'm sorry, I didn't actually hear anybody pronounce it. But uh, uh, a lovely little uh, camera from uh, based on their very solid technology. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, PL mounts, so it's got a, a, a lens uh, capability that's open to pretty much uh, every other cinematic lens yeah. set out there. Um, and various other technology that sort of will allow. And, and I mean, clearly, though, the, the, uh, uh, there must be enough leeway in the market for for cameras, yeah. mustn't there? So. Yeah. I mean, they're basically using the uh, SLR type sensors, the APS-C size sensors, um, which are 
uh, then to couple with um, decent electronic shutter technology and high speed uh, image processing for uh, in, in the background uh, and are competing against you know the, the, the first people in the environment like a sort of red camera uh, so the people at black magic Aja, Ari have had technology to do this in the past, but now it's sort of really being pushed to the forefront. And is it is it um, AJA's? Who does their? Who made their sensor? Is it their own, Neil? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Or is it? Are they using a sensor I'm from an sure elsewhere? Who makes the sensor. They, they, I didn't learn who makes the sensor. I mean, if, you, if you look at it in the grand scheme of things, there aren't actually that many manufacturers of these sensors. No. Uh, you know, even. Nikon use the uh, Sony sensor in their products, or some of their products. But uh, um, you know, you've got, uh, for example, uh, Sony producing probably the, a very large lion's share of the sensors out there. But I, I must confess, I'm, I'm not sure who who makes uh, Arjas. I'm afraid. I, th I mean, okay. for me, the thing that that that's kind of c come out of all this is the fact that. Um, you know, you've got people like Blackmagic who are producing products with their 6G video interface. Yes. Uh, you, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and the truth of the matter is, at 6G, all you can achieve is 30 frames per second at 422 encoding. Um, and 30 frames a second is fine. Well, 24 frames a second is fine for film production, but 30 frames a second is, is, is really used to neither man nor biscuit if, if, if you're doing live television production. Um, uh, I went to a fantastic thing at the uh, at the uh, the um, where was it the uh, British Film Institute a couple of years ago, where the BBC was showing 4K and 8K material shot at 30, 60, and 120 frames a second. Yeah, I and, saw that. Yeah, and and in fact, you know, football footage shot at 30 frames a second is unwatchable at 4K because you know when the camera uh, you know is static, you've got oodles of resolution and the pictures look glorious as soon as the camera starts to move and you've got a full 30th of a mm. second between f pictures all of a sudden the difference between the, 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 the static resolution and the dynamic resolution is so different that your eye recoils and, and it's, it's, it's difficult to watch and so the BBC's take is they're not going to even start fiddling with 4K until 120 frames per second is possible and that's entirely mm. down to live production you can't have live sports events or things where cameras move heaven forbid um, at only 30 frames a second or even 60 frames a second 60 progressive frames which is a 12G signal and at 120 frames a second it's a 24G signal and if it's 120 frames a second and you really want to capture it RGB so you can do some decent processing with it afterwards that's a 48G signal, 48 gigabits per second, and that doesn't go down copper cable for sure. So I think it'll be a long, long time before 4K is anything other than, um, you know, the sort of the, the, the little tickler at the end of trade shows. I, I, you know, I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, obviously, a lot of these cameras are producing 4K, and there's increasingly a, a stirring in post to to dual finish a 4K and HD kind of show but in, in terms of live production um, it's not really there yet and there were you know there was a couple of solutions sort of talking about 12g at the show again just sort of reading around it but I'm not sure if anyone was sort of actively sort of live I'm not sure if there's a, a 12g shipping product other than some sort of interconnect stuff or well or no chip there's the, um, or the, the rest, yeah uh, Grant Petty's um, take on a Rank Intel uh, Telecine machine has a 12G output, and I mean it's just right. because I mean HDSDI is an extensible standard, you know, and, and and so long as your cables can do it, you can you can basically define in the in in the um, in the in the TRS headers how how the data is packed on on a on a um, an HDSDI signal, and so although it's only that that telecine machine and presumably some more black magic products that are, are no doubt either about to launch or, or launch at the show that support 12g mm. so that gives you 60 progressive frames per second maximum at 422 at 4k or at 3850 uh, by uh, 2160 on the Arja stand they had an fs1 uh, a new model of the fs1 frame sync and uh, that had a pair of SFPs on the back of it rather than BNCs or in yeah. addition to BNCs. So clearly they're gearing their new product up for faster interfaces. Okay, so so, so SFPs with, for SMPTE 297M, yeah? Yeah. 
well, it's fiber optic connections, um, duplex connections. So you know, you've got dual bandwidth uh, connectivity there, which is uh, pretty interesting. I, I must confess, I didn't sort of uh, get to speak to anybody who could explain to me what these um, SFPs were actually ultimately designed for, um, but I hope to get that resolved fairly soon. Well, if it's if it's anything like the FS2, the, the FS2 has um, SMPTE 297 brackets 2006 or whenever the standard was for HDSDI over fiber on the back of it, over 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 multi-mode fiber, so OM3 fiber. Cool. So 4K, splendid. What, 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 what's... Um, what, what, what else was was evident at the show? What, what else? I noticed Joel Gilbert's with us, but no picture yes, of him yet. Indeed. And I noticed his microphone's uh, muted as well. Door. Yeah. Joel, unmute that microphone. Do you have the um, chat tab open, Phil? Cause I no, do, yeah. Joel's probably the thing on the chat. Joel was just saying that the, the, the Blackmagic studio camera has been kind of panned as well. So the... I mean, it, the, the Blackmagic offerings were... Uh, you, you sort of can't help but sort of, you know, talk about them in the sense that, you know, their, their scanner that they were showing, the wall mount scanner that was sort of, you know, thanks to their sort of Sintel acquisition, you know, that they were sort of touting around all, they were talking about 30K, um, $30,000 as, as a price tag, is you know, if they're nothing if not spectacularly disruptive, um, you know, black magic. Yes. And, um, you sort of can't help. I could. I can only imagine that you know a lot of the other scanner manufacturers, who hopefully have by now sort of definitely recovered their money, you know, m must sort of feel like dead men walking when Blackmagic sort of pins something up like that in their patch. Because as we've seen from their their cinema <coughs> camera and so forth, they've um they, they've apparently shifted quite a few units. Unfortunately, getting real data on precisely how many they've sold is is sort of near to impossible. But um, speaking to a bunch of folks around town in terms of just taking a straw poll from them and asking, have you seen much footage come out of it? And there's been a small percentage, but um, certainly no one seems to be, to, you know, rushing to, to buy, you know, the, the, the Blackmagic cinema camera. But as we've seen before, you know, people poo-pooed their, you know, their, their, their video router technology and, you know, their, their initial offerings. And now several years later, you know, they've they they sort of uh, have quite a respectable reputation on on the whole. So you know, they are spectacular, and they will, you know, they will kind of crowbar and they will sort of crowbar their way into the market. Ultimately, they just definitely do have that ability. So um, I just I didn't I didn't expect at the risk of sort of waffling on to sort of see. I didn't expect as many new cameras as we saw from folks like Blackmagic from AJA. And so forth, you know. At the show, you sort of thought, you know, the, the 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 market for new cameras was somewhere, you know, towards saturation point in terms of, you know, who needs a new format. But but clearly, there's an appetite for them, and clearly, there's 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 a market out there. Otherwise, you know, the, these folks wouldn't be, you know, developing them, you know, at the risk of making a trite point. So I think that was quite interesting for me. So, well, I suppose I bumped into um, uh Sorry, Phil, I bumped into um, our friends from Envy at the show and they said they were seeing more and more stuff coming in from Black Magic. Right. Okay. Interestingly, one piece of sort of anecdotal evidence, but I agree with you. I mean, the camera, camera market would be, um, you know, not my first choice of place to jump into if I was... No, no, it, it's, and, um, but it's, you know, I think clearly those folks are doing a lot, you know, they're not doing it on a, on a whim. And um, I know, guess they're not selling many um, video I/O cards these days. No, no, indeed. So, well, not if you're shooting on a black magic camera and, and extracting the files. No. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> I, I mean, cool. in, in terms of cameras, it, it's kind of interesting. That I mean, there are only so many OB trucks and five, six camera. Uh, LE studios in the world, aren't there? Uh, you know, if you're if you're Thompson or or, or Sony, uh, you know, manufacturing your you know LDK series high def television cameras, that there can't be that many channels that you can sell every year. But there are hundreds of people doing what they would like to be higher end 
um, kind of you know speciality kind of sports, two cameras, sort of news, local telly. There, there must be lots and lots of people who are more than happy to stump up for a you know a Black Magic camera and see some quite impressive results. I'm sure compared to you know buying traditional TV cameras. That's stumped you all, hasn't it? <laughs> I didn't ever come back on that film. <laughs> Oh, so it is said, so it is written. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, if if the, the the thing that surprised me with with Black Magic was you think, well, they're still manufacturing baseband video products, um, and and yes. and you know very very modestly, very cheaply, uh, but they're, they're producing a blinking telecine machine. You think there can't be that many years left of people needing to, you know, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, does it? <laughs> Well, I think it's, uh, I guess, you know, if you look at the evolution of black magic, you know, sort of uh, 10 or 12 years ago, they were all sort of, you know, whenever sort of Grant was lit sort of digital voodoo or whatever they were called, you know, he, he's taken that company from strength to strength. And he's sort of definitely been a democratizing force, you know, for better or for worse um, in the in the video and, and sort of broadcast community. So... You know, I think, as I say, I think you sort of can't ever sort of underestimate their influence. And certainly, if sort of last year's NAB was anything to go by and the year before, I mean, they had a sort of a football field-sized stand um, in the in the South Hall and, um, you nice know, a massive amount of acreage. And, you know, they're a, they're a big kind of, they're a, a major force in our sort of industry. You know, people use their stuff. It's, it's all over. And... Um, it, you know, they if they are if they are kind of going into the scanner market, and I agree with with both of you. I, I sort of again, I just didn't see that one kind of coming in terms of clearly they they see some sort of market there, that some sort of pent up demand for a bunch of these devices for people to sort of you know digitize all their old archive footage and all the rest. So um, see, I, you know, I wonder if they've taken the view that. Um, yeah, there's still a few houses, obviously, places like TK1 in town and places like that that are still running spirits and, and those are old yeah. school million pound telecines or film scanners, film yeah. like north lights or whatever. I wonder if they take the view that we will provoke uh, a, a whole load of archive work merely by having affordable telecines available. I, I, think, I think that's exactly it. I think the perceived view on this is that there's a massive amount of archive um, footage that's not seeing the light of day simply because it's not cost effective to yeah, but there's, there's no capture money. it. Yeah, and so consequently, if you have cheap tools, um, effectively that require you know very little skill, um, you know presumably that will be a driver to kind of unlock some of this content. So, you know, you can't sort of really find anything negative about it other than it would, I imagine, definitely impact companies that are sort of having this income stream as their sort of bread and butter, as it were, so. I see Rupert's just joined us. So, um, <laughs> you almost certainly have an opinion on that. <laughs> so, um, Where's my caption? Uh, you have to you make have that. To <laughs> <laughs> we're just finishing up Rupert we, we promised we weren't going to yabber on for more than about an hour um, uh, but right. we've, we've talked about audio loudness and 4k and, and stuff from NAB and Avid and such uh, what have you got to tell us Mr. Boss Man <laughs> what is your <laughs> NAB takeaway Rupert as it were the takeaway from NAB is that everyone's talking about 4k but nobody I know is doing it I think. yeah has anybody, has anybody actually met somebody who's got a 4K production on the go? Uh, yeah, we've spoken to a couple, haven't we, around town? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, 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 that no. are actually having to, to deliver HD and 4K, certainly, well, two uh, that are currently on the go that I know of directly, yeah. I know Arsenal are experimenting with it, They're, um, but just, just for internal purposes. Um, oh, and so the now, they may be key, Sony may be key, but who's actually got a live production? Who's actually rocking the 4K? I don't know about live. And, and I, I I've, really not, I've honestly not met anybody. So yeah, what no. frame rate are Arsenal playing with, Phil, just out of interest? Uh, 30 frames or 25 frames. Uh, you yeah. know, but but it's just really for their promo stuff, uh, and, I, and I, they've got no outlet for it at the moment. It's just really to to, to, to for the interest, really. 
Yes, and I mean the 30k. The, sorry, the 30k. The the, the 4k stuff that we know of at the moment. That, that's being that's shot and being posted. It's not anywhere near live. And um, one is a. They're both short form pieces. So you know you're right. The the the, the, the offerings at the moment are relatively modest. So. So um. Hello, you can hear me now. It's Joel. Joel, splendid to hello, hear from people. you, old boy. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah, good man. How are you? I've got, I've got a minute. I found a minute. Um, so CTV did a did a um a 4K live job a few weeks ago at the uh, at Warhorse. It did a live uh, 4K yes. to, to, yeah, to the cinemas. That, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know the director chat. Yeah, my friend Tim Taylor was the Rex engineer. <laughs> Oh, uh, right, okay. So, and I happened to go to the, a cinema, it was the new cinema in Wembley, which was apparently the only cinema that could, uh, in the country, that can take live 4K, oh, right. you know, to the screen. It's a brand new one in a, in a big, you know, multiplex in Wembley. Um, but the, apparently they, the, the vision mixer they were used was, was a Sony vision mixer, but it was with some, like, sort of new sort of experimental firmware where where they used um four inputs on this vision mixer hd inputs and 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 you know and and made them into a, a one quad hd uh uhd yeah picture. in fact it's so worse than that they, they have to use four me's so they have to have sony's biggest uh, is it a DME 7000? Uh, and I'm they not have, sure. They have to have a fully stuffed DME 7000 with four MEs, and they tie mm. up all four MEs. So any transitions, any mix effects, any wipes or whatever have to be done through four MEs rather than just one ME. And it is, it is. I don't know if any of you remember the old, the old Voodoo D6 uh, digital VTR standard, um, which used four D1 machines. Um, right. It's exactly the same thing. It's, it's, it's basically, you know, just using a lot of, a lot of pixel pipes. Uh, that would yeah. normally have several signals going down them, and and you've split the signal up a few times. Yeah, but um, apparently it went all right. But bloody hell, sounds a bit experimental. Yeah, sure. but presumably they must have compressed to get that out to the cinema. They've got to go through a live encoding box that will put yeah. it into a bit screen that they're pushing. Which 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 I I don't know what they were doing at that end. I just know from the director's sort of perspective mm. what was going along really. Mm. Okay. But, Interesting, though. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. took the output of that and put it through a clipster to do the DCP for those who didn't get it live. So ah, really okay. Really. <laughs> <laughs> but, Turns you know, out I did. There's, there's, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot, that, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of concerts happening at the moment, which, you know, Sony seems to be pouring money into sort of, you know, concert production, but but it's all XAVC, you is, know. Is that as a it's PR not, it's not live, it's not for live their stuff, Carl, or? Sorry? Is that as a kind of a marketing exercise for their... Yeah, very yeah. much so, and to generate content for, for their panels that they're wanting to sell, you know? Quite how anyone's delivering it to the home at the moment. I mean, you know, Blu-ray, I, I don't know. I don't know about Blu-ray and 4K. No, it's doesn't, file. It doesn't support it. Yeah, there you go. So it's file no, you, can buy, you can buy the little Sony box and you get a subscription and then you download... That's right, because they launched the player yesterday or... Uh, no, it was a long time ago. Mm. They've been around for years. It's a little circular thing. You can download content into oh, it. There's a new thing they announced, though, very recently, a, a new 4K player. Um, anyway, I digress. But yeah, I'm, I'm presuming that, it's all, you know, that they need content for that player then, you know. Yeah. Um, it's not compelling, is it, though? <laughs> Where's my captain? <laughs> you got to you got to make it yourself, Rui. No. Anyway, chaps, I've got to jump out, so I'm going to love and leave you. And uh, thanks for the experience. Um, thanks very yes, much. Yes, I'm sorry I was late to the game, chaps. I was really hoping to make it earlier, but um, it's it's, it's, the day, it's the day before Easter, you know. Easter eggs to buy. I haven't even got that far yet. So the plan, I've got to go too, guys. jolly good. Mm -hmm. See you soon, Marcus. The plan, Joel, is to make this a regular thing and just kind of people drift in and out, and we'll record it and chop it up for the interesting bits. Bill, you've gone all radiophonic workshop on us, mate. Yeah, you've. Yes, gone, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry that I missed all of your thoughts on uh, NAB and Avid and everything. I've really been interested to hear them. So if I could, if I could watch it back, Phil, I would, uh, I would, I would be interested. Be on the Route Six YouTube's before you know it. Yeah, you are. That's what he said. You're definitely sounding robotic, Phil. Yeah, You're definitely. Very, very Dalek like. Yeah. Right. Cheers, everyone. Bye bye. Don't exterminate the session. Cheers, everyone. See you later. See you soon. Cheers, Charlie. Take care, mate. Enjoy Thanks your Easter, everyone.
So how do we? How do you finish a hang up elegantly, Philly? That's the question. Uh, well, when you sound like a robot, you can't. <laughs> Can we get?